ladies and gentlemen, um, I think we can be slowly, slowly starting. My name is Jakub Nowakowski, and as a director of the Galicia Jewish Museum, this is this is my uh, honor and, and privilege to um, to start this this project to welcome uh, all of you, uh, but also all of our speakers uh, and, and partners. Um, mm, we're we're grateful for you to be joining uh, the last uh, today's program um, devoted to uh, the issue of memory. Um, the program is is a part of the a larger project devoted to the Action Reinhardt, uh, eight years after the industrial killing of European uh, Jewry. Um, and the program, the project was marking the 80th anniversary from that, um, from that um, horrible operation. Uh, and today we are to talk about the memory. Uh, what do we remember? How do we, do we remember? And who remembers? And we have a very special guest uh, um, today, speakers, uh, Professor James Young, Professor Omer Bartov, and uh, activist and Olympic uh, sportsman um, Dariusz uh, Popiela. And, and now I will switch to, to Polish for a second. Szanowni Państwo, um, bardzo serdecznie witamy podczas ostatniego panelu um, poświęconego um, rocznicy, 80. rocznicy operacji Reinhardt. Um, całe spotkanie będzie prowadzone w języku e, angielskim. Dla tych z Państwa, którzy chcieliby skorzystać z tłumaczenia, e, bardzo proszę o mm, odszukanie na dole ekranu e, ikonki e, Globusa, e, kliknięcie na, na tą ikonkę i wybranie e, m, PL Polish. To pozwoli Państwu e, przełączyć się na kanał, e, na którym nasz tłumacz, Pan Adam Musiał, e, będzie tłumaczył wszystko, co, m, co będą mówili uczestnicy. Um, ladies and, and, and gentlemen, um, before I will pass this, this virtual uh, floor to, uh, to Dr. Edita Gavron, who will be leading today's discussion, uh, I'd like to um, take one moment of your time to express uh, my thanks to the partners uh, with whom we've uh, organized uh, all four events. Um, Tallinn Aids from the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center and uh, Marine Shahar from the Ghetto Fighters House um, Tali Marine, it's been an uh, absolute uh, pleasure and honor to be working on this program uh, with you and your colleagues. Um, and, and together, uh, over those, those all four events, we've discussed uh, some of the, the most important aspects of the Action Reinhardt. With Professor Michael Berenbaum, we've uh, talked about the road to the final solution. Uh, with uh, Chris Webb and with Tali Nates, we've discussed the mass killings of 1942 and 1943. Uh, and the Kinnick Centers, um, with Professor uh, Caroline Study uh, Collins and Dr. Tamir Hart, with uh, Jaron um, Tsur, we've discussed the Treblinka, uh, the resistance in, in Treblinka. And uh, today, uh, together with uh, Professor Young, uh, Dariusz Popila and Professor Bartov, we will be talking about uh, the memory. And again, um, translation, uh, trans Tłumaczenie dla Państwa, którzy nie rozumieją po angielsku jest dostępne. Proszę kliknąć na ikonę Globusa i wybrać język e, polski. Um, the questions, uh, please write your questions in the chat folder. If there is only a time at the end, uh, we will be delighted to take some of those uh, questions. And last but not least, um, the event is recorded. So um, uh, the recording will be available uh, at the YouTube channel of the Galicia uh, Jewish Museum. Uh, where you already can see the recording of the previous uh, parts of the of the of the program. Um, so that seems to be all uh, on my end. And now I would like to pass uh, the, the floor and introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Edita Gavron, a scholar, researcher, curator, and author and editor of of numerous publications and and articles. Uh, and uh, that includes a, a very fresh uh, uh, publication, the history of the. Jews of Krakow that was published just uh, three, four weeks uh, ago. Um, thank you, uh, Edita, for, for joining us uh, today and, and for agreeing to moderate this program. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jakub, for the introduction and thank you for uh, the invitation to the event today, to the panel discussion. It's really my pleasure and honor to lead this uh, final meeting of the series as described uh, previously. 
the last part of it is devoted to the issue of uh, remembering remembrance commemoration what do we remember how do we remember who remembers uh, these are the questions that we'll try to answer and we have three speakers uh, during this panel um, will allow uh, each of the speakers to have short presentation introducing the projects uh, they've been involved in and uh, then uh, um, we'll have the discussion uh, we'll invite also the audience to take part in the discussion at the end um, the first person to uh, speak is professor uh, james young i would like to uh, ask uh, Professor uh, Young to talk uh, uh, about uh, some of his projects uh, uh, and uh, his presentation will, um, initial presentation will, uh, will describe uh, the first memorials at Majdanek, Auschwitz and Buchenwald, among others. Then we'll hear uh, Professor Almer Bartov talking about his uh, experience and his research on Buchaj. And last but not least, uh, Darius Popela will talk about the most contemporary project, uh, People Not Numbers, uh, and his uh, leading role in this project. So that's the plan for today. To start um, our presentations, I would like to uh, say a few words about uh, Professor Young, who is a distinguished university professor of English and Judaic studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, and uh, the founding director of the Institute for Holocaust, Genocide and Memorial Studies uh, at UMass Amherst. Um, the uh, list of accomplishments is enormous, so let me just briefly uh, mention some of them. He taught at several universities, including New York University, Harvard, uh, Princeton, and University of Washington. Uh, he's the author of numerous books, including um, the uh, recent one, the stages uh, of memory, uh, reflections that, uh, on memorial art, loss, and the spaces in between. Uh, he's also the consultant and expert invited to a work on several um, memorials, including memorial uh, to Europe mar Europe's martyred Jews, uh, and also the uh, consultant uh, uh, during the um, jury work on National 9-11 Memorial uh, in uh, New York. Uh, and uh, I could um, list the number of periodicals that uh, Professor Young has written, uh, some articles and op-eds and uh, uh, many texts, uh, and also the list of awards, it's really impressive. But uh, we are all looking forward to the presentation and to sharing the wisdom and experience. So let me finish right now. And uh, Professor Young, the floor is yours. We are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Tali, Medin, <clears throat> and Jakub for organizing, uh, and Dita for moderating uh, the panel. Um, so I've taken um, the invitation quite literally uh, to uh, look at the very, very, very first uh, memorial uh, sites. And of course, these very first memorial sites were the uh, sites of destruction. Uh, specifically, even while the war uh, was still raging, uh, memorials were created in places like Buchenwald uh, uh, and Majdanek, uh, even, even Stutthof uh, in Poland. Um, and so I wanted to uh, go back uh, and look at uh, what and how they were remembering uh, at the very, very, uh, at, the, at the very premise. Uh, and probably in discussion, we'll figure out, in fact, how memory has evolved at each of these sites. What's remembered now is very different from what was remembered uh, you know, for example, at Majdanek 35 years ago, uh, 40 years ago on my first visit there. And that was even different from how um, the, the Red Army uh, created the very first Memorial Museum there uh, in October uh, 1944, uh, just three months after its liberation, you know, in, in July 1944. Uh, so that was uh, one, you know, one of the very, very first, um, probably the first so-called um, Holocaust or concentration camp memorial uh, established. So, um, of course, the very first memorials established uh, in the case of Buchenwald was, in fact, <clears throat> 
by the prisoners themselves. I'm going to share an image here with you. Sorry about the quality, but this was literally taken, uh, I think, by American uh, uh, liberating soldiers of a memorial uh, that was built by survivors at Buchenwald in April 1945, within a few days of their liberation uh, by American soldiers. It's an obelisk, you see, it's made out of wood. And it's hard to see in this image, um, but the letters KLB for Konzentrationslager, uh, Buchenwald, uh, are there. And um, so obviously this was prisoners remembering their own. And they did it in this very traditional form uh, made out of wood, which they scavenged uh, from barracks um, and, and built themselves, uh, both to remember their own and to remember uh, themselves in some ways uh, as survivors of Buchenwald. <clears throat> so there was a, an actually a, a memorial built here also um, by Horst Hoheisel. Um, which I was trying to bring up here, um, uh, to remember this memorial. It's called the Memorial to a Memorial, the War Memorial. And on the 50th anniversary of Buchenwald's liberation, uh, Volkart Kniege, the director of the Buchenwald Museum and Memorial, invited Horst Hoheisel to, to commemorate this, uh, this destroyed memorial that you see on the screen here. And for whatever reason, that one's not coming up. So. Um, it's a slab of concrete uh, heated to uh, 37.5 Celsius, 98.6 uh, Fahrenheit to um, approximate the uh, human temperature. So it stays uh, snow free uh, during the winter and when people often kneel to touch it. And it's just to remember that the memorial is commemorating something built by human hands, by the prisoners' hands themselves. So a memorial to a memorial. And maybe before we're done, I'll, I'll, I'll find that image for you too. So we're gonna now go to Majdanek. And again, I guess the, uh, the very first Holocaust Memorial Museum, uh, in fact, was established. Um, by the Soviets in October 1944. Uh, on their way in, they had liberated Majdanek, the concentration camp, just a little bit before uh, in that July. And here, um, I'm, again, I, pardon me for being a little bit literal minded, but I'm going to read exactly how the, read you exactly what the captions were at the time. Is they're very specific. And if we're going to ask that question, who remembers and how do they remember and what they remember, um, I'm going to literally read to you uh, the guidebook that explains what is being remembered here. And I'm going to read to you um, uh, what it said on the walls at the time. So these photographs are from 1980. Uh, it, that was my first visit uh, to Majdanek. Um, and this was, these were already kind of an evolved exhibition. It wasn't exactly what was installed there in 1944, but it was uh, close enough because it was still you know, a very much a Soviet interpretation. And by Soviet interpretation, I'm going to read you exactly what they said. <clears throat> So in the words of the guidebook, the aim of the memorial at Majdanek that you're looking at here is threefold, to preserve the buildings as material evidence of the crimes committed here, to analyze the facts of these crimes, and to present and not analyze facts to the public. But it also becomes clear the ruins here are really um, being used as material evidence um, for uh, the kind of the, the curated uh, the curated facts as as remembered here at Majdanek. And so here at Majdanek, the objects really tell the story of the camp's Soviet liberators, configured in a pretty reflexively you know, Marxist interpretation of the war as victims. And one of the results is that the Jewish victims of Majdanek are kind of assimilated twice over, once to the memory of Polish national suffering, and again to a stridently economic critique of the of the camp blind to the ethnic identity of the victims, 
um, at Majdanek, uh, about four fifths of the 350,000 uh, murdered victims uh, were Jews. Um, uh, but they're mostly Jews are recalled here as parts of other persecuted groups, including the Poles, communists, and Soviet POWs. So as we enter this very first barrack here, and we have some uh, actual Polish translators uh, who can even be more refined, but so we've got something called Hitlerism in the years 1933 to 1942. And um, we read here in the exhibition that, uh, quote, with the help of German industrialists on January 30, 1933, Adolf Hitler became chancellor of the German Reich. The coming into power of the fascists marked the beginning of a period of brutal and ruthless dictatorship. The arson of the Reichstag served as an excuse for granting the government extraordinary plenipotentiaries and for endowing Hitler with unlimited power. Mass persecution of communists, socialists, and Jews followed. And in those days, and to this day, you see uh, Polish teachers bringing their school children to Majdanek. <clears throat> These photographs are part of the exhibition that the kids will see. And then, of course, this exhibit <clears throat> uh, on extermination at Majdanek, uh, you've got the can, empty cans of Cyclone Bay, um, and you've got this you know, kind of the striped uniforms of the prisoners. Um, and then, of course, you have only the red triangle signifying the political prisoners. Um, so, you know, in this little arrangement, um, you've got, you know, basically four fifths of the, the victims of Majdanek um, murdered as Jews, um, being represented as, you know, murdered as, as political victims here. So it wasn't a matter of really um, ignoring uh, Jewish identity so much as conflating it with Polish and even um, uh, Red Army identity uh, in, in, in many cases here. And again, I would like to um, read exactly what they say in the guidebook. <clears throat> that Jews and citizens of various states considered to be of Jewish descent constituted the next largest group after Poles. Poles constituted the most numerous group and all, almost all of them were political prisoners. Uh, literally, literally true. Um, Jews happen to constitute the largest group of Poles there, though. Uh, they were put into the camp for racial reasons. A large proportion of the camp population was represented by citizens of the Soviet Union, many of whom were war prisoners. And so, you know, quite literally, this is this is all true. But they're all all of the prisoners are being remembered in the sign of political prisoners in the red triangle here. And we can come back and put this slide up and um, uh, we can have it translated by our uh, Polish hosts here. So the ash uh, carted out of the, uh, the crematoria at Majdanek were collected in kind of a very uh, traditional kind of uh, uh, Eastern Orthodox urn. And in some other images, I'll show you the Victor Tolkien uh, statue you know, as well. So this is all regarded as evidence of the crimes here, but the evidence for what? And early on, the crimes were described as, uh, as, as you've just heard, but these have evolved over time. And what you find there now, um, I understand is very, very different. But you see the, the exhibition is basically punctuated by the red triangles. Now at Auschwitz also, um, Huge expanse here, Beer Canal, and here to Auschwitz one. I'm going to, and at Auschwitz in particular, we get kind of the the evolution of memory is is much clearer. But a, again, the relics would really seem to tell a story. The barracks are intact. These are shaving brushes uh, saved here, piles of hair, uh, the guard towers, the barbed wire fences. <clears throat> uh, the fences uh, were restored. Some of the guard towers were kind of restored afterwards. 
1957, the Auschwitz uh, Committee uh, launched a gigantic international uh, competition for a memorial to be placed at the very end of the railroad tracks at Birkenau. Uh, this was the uh, winning design. Uh, but when it was mounted, it was regarded by um, Polish authorities when it was mounted in 1967, uh, when it was finally installed, um, as referring to specifically uh, to, as you see here, human forms, uh, tall, medium, and short ones. Uh, and the only short ones would be children. And clearly, uh, at Auschwitz, it was Jewish children and, uh, and Sinti and Roma children um, being murdered there. And so, down came these figures of the families and up went a block uh, of granite with a single triangle in the very middle of it. And again, what is being remembered here in 1967, really when Poland was in the midst of its own uh, kind of um, uh, anti-Jewish purges, that 4 million people suffered and died here at the hands of the Nazi murderers between the years 1940 and 1945. And of course, uh, historians have always known, including uh, uh, the historians based um, uh, in, in Poland and Auschwitz, um, that around 1.1 to 1.2 million maximum uh, people were murdered uh, at Auschwitz-Birkenau, uh, about probably 90% of them Jews, the others uh, Soviet POWs, uh, Sinti and Roma, and Polish political prisoners. This was changed so that even when you've got facts, so-called facts carved into the stone, in 1989, uh, with the fall of the uh, Iron Curtain, and uh, Tadek uh, Mazowiecki, the new prime minister, he invited me and uh, Michael Berenbaum and a, a handful of others to form an Auschwitz council to revise the historical facts here. And so they did. And they began by taking away those inscriptions making them blank for a while. So you might just call this, um, you, know, uh, you know, memory in transition. But the blown up gas chambers, the crosses put up with, you know, Jewish stars by local uh, uh, Polish youth groups. And of course, uh, the visit, the very first visit by a West German chancellor to Poland uh, after the war, um, is explicitly explained uh, here in the New York Times on November 15th, 1989, just a few days after the fall of the wall. Cole ends trip to Poland with a visit to Auschwitz. Cole recalls Auschwitz and as a consequence, agrees to aid Poles in their conversion, you know, to, uh, in their conversion to the West. And this is the, uh, the huge uh, memorial uh, figure uh, by Victor Tolkien, which was established uh, or dedicated uh, September 1st, 1969 on the 30th anniversary uh, of the German Nazi invasion of Poland. And through it, again, the focus is primarily on that uh, crematorium gas chamber complex, you know, right through there, the, the so-called Valley of Death. And once again, the the shoes, the clothes, the hats are all basically used here to uh, provide evidence of what they might call economic plunder. Yeah, they function as exhibition storerooms, <clears throat> but basically material evidence of the economic death and plundering of victims by German Nazi industrialists, according to explanatory notes uh, inside. And of course, Treblinka, uh, this memorial <clears throat> by an artist, an architect, Polish artist, Polish architect, dedicated in 1964 to commemorate the some 800,000 <clears throat> Jews murdered here. The names carved in are, are Stetlach, uh, towns of uh, uh, Polish uh, Jewish shtetls. And what is remembered here is never again, Nie wieder in several languages. What is to be repeat, not to be repeated here, of course, um, ends up being surmised uh, by visitors to the camp. Janusz Korczak is the only individual here, head of the Jewish uh, orphanage in Warsaw, who went with his charges to Treblinka rather than being separated from them.
and visited often. So, you know, we'll recall that right now, um, the memory kind of constructed and created at, at all of these sites depends completely on who visits them, under what circumstances, uh, who leads the tours. Uh, and uh, these memories and meanings continue to evolve over time. And I think maybe that'll be our, our point of discussion as we jump off into that. So uh, thank you very much for letting me share a few of these images and um, look forward to hearing Omer and uh, Dariush. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you, Professor Young, for this presentation of the early memorials. Uh, and uh, we'll definitely get back to some ideas you shared. Uh, now is the time for um, a short presentation by Professor Omer Bartov, who is uh, uh, a professor of Brown University, Samuel Pisser, um, professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at the Department of History, and also the faculty fellow at Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. Uh, the author of numerous publications, numerous books, uh, uh, again, I will just mention a few uh, apologies for that. Uh, um, starting with the tales from the borderlands, making and unmaking the Galician past. I couldn't skip this one uh, being hosted by Galicia Jewish Museum. Uh, voices, uh, the other one, Voices on War and Genocide, three accounts of the war, world wars uh, in a Galician town. And uh, the book that I'm sure you will have some references to today, Anatomy of the, of the Genocide, the Life and Death of a Town Called Buchach. Of course, I, took, I could talk more about the publications, the research projects, editorial boards that Professor Bartov uh, is participating in. Uh, but I think uh, uh, we are all looking forward to the presentation and to uh, the talk about post-war commem commemoration in Buchach, uh, how commemorative uh, practices have changed uh, and how the memory laws uh, in Ukraine, Poland and Israel has evol have evolved uh, recently. So, Professor Bartov, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and thank you everyone for uh, joining this panel. Thank you for inviting me to it. Uh, I said uh, initially that I wouldn't share a PowerPoint, but I changed my mind, so I will be sharing PowerPoint, uh, and it's coming up, uh, and hopefully you can see it. Yes, we can. Yes, okay. So um, I'm going to try and do two things, uh, and I'll probably run out of time, so I'll do the best I can. Um, so as some of you know, I uh, wrote a, a fair amount about Buchat, which is my mother's hometown. Uh, this little girl, there is my mother, my mother, uh, my mother's family uh, on both sides, her, her paternal and maternal uh, grandparents came, uh, parents and grandparents came from this area. Um, um, most of those people that you see in the picture, if they did not die before World War I, were murdered uh, in the Holocaust. And so the people who came to Palestine, which were my mother and her two brothers and her parents were basically uh, all that survived from my own family in, uh, in Buchach and, and not only Buchach, but in the surrounding area. Um, so this made me interested in this town. This was one reason that I chose to write on a, a micro history of Buchach. I also was interested in the place because it was the hometown, as a number of you would know, of Shmuel Yosef Agnon, uh, uh, formerly known as Chachkes, um, who um, uh, was born and raised in Buchach, uh, left it as a 21-year-old uh, man and went to Palestine, uh, to Jaffa um, in 1908. Um, and wrote a, a great deal of his writing was about Buchach and the book that was just mentioned, thank you for mentioning it, A Tales from the Borderland, uh, has a great deal also of his writings and descriptions of Buchach, both stories, myths, and legends. Uh, this town Buchach, for those of you who don't know, is now in West Ukraine. Uh, so if you look to the left of this image, uh, south from Lviv, uh, a bit to the east uh, would be Buchach. Uh, in the interwar period, it was in Poland, 
um, um, in, in, um, in the southeastern uh, bit of Poland, which was a majority Ukrainian area with a large uh, Polish minority and a very large Jewish population. Uh, and before that, it was in uh, East Galicia within the uh, Austrian Empire. Um, and, and that's just an image of this town um, um, before the war. Uh, there's, there's various interesting aspects to this, but I won't go into all of that. Uh, and a lively scene in this town in the, in, in the interwar town. Um, it was occupied by the Germans who came uh, also with their families to this bucolic place, uh, had a pretty good time there and murdered the entire Jewish population in the region, 60,000 uh, people. Um, it is still a, um, somewhat uh, of a tourist uh, attraction in Ukraine today, mostly thanks to its city hall, um, uh, which was uh, built in the 18th century. And in Tales from the Borderlands, I tell uh, a number of stories about who created it and why Agnon had his own mythology about the origins of this uh, um, Rococo 18th century structure. Uh, the the murder of the Jews in the in, in the town occurred mostly uh, in two places. About half of the population was deported to um, Berzhets and murdered there, and the other half, over half of the population, over five thousand, uh, were murdered either on the um, on on the Fedor Hill, Fedir Hill, uh, in, in this area or uh, in the area of the Jewish cemetery. Uh, so. Right after the war, the few survivors, there were about 8,000 Jews in Buchach before the war, uh, but about 10,000 Jews uh, ultimately uh, were murdered either in Buchach or deported from Buchach because people were taken from elsewhere, uh, from other communities, concentrated there, and then either murdered in situ or deported. Uh, in this picture, there are about 60 people, and they actually erected a memorial uh, in, on the Federal Hill, where the largest amount of uh, the largest mass graves were located, um, and, but this memorial disappeared shortly thereafter. We only have uh, a couple of images of it, uh, and it it likely was removed by the Soviets, who who did not like um, ethno specific uh, memorials after the war and removed a large number of them. Uh, so when I came there, uh, there was nothing. Uh, I came there for the first time in 2003. Uh, the Federal Hill had been planted uh, by a forest uh, and one had to wander very deep into the forest uh, to find a single memorial, which actually commemorated only the first uh, killing of the so-called intelligentsia, about 450, uh, members of the white collar profession uh, by the Germans in uh, August of 1941. Uh, this area is filled with, with mass graves. They were unmarked then, and they're still unmarked today. Uh, so you can identify them, uh, especially in summer, uh, but it's very hard to find them and it's not as easy to identify them. There is a big memorial there, but that memorial is to uh, the freedom fighters of Ukraine, uh, largely to the OUN UPA, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists and the Ukrainian Insurgent Army, um, commemorating really the struggle against what they saw as the reoccupation of Ukraine by uh, the Red Army in 1944, an insurgency that continued well into the late 1940s, cost tens of thousands of lives, uh, and Obviously, these uh, commemorative efforts were made after uh, Ukrainian independence in 1991. In between, uh, obviously, one could not commemorate uh, those freedom fighters who were considered by the Soviets to be um, pro-fascist elements. Um, the, the other killing side, the, the Jewish cemetery until very recently, uh, looked more or less like this. Uh, it has been, uh, in, in the last few years, it has been surrounded by a wall. Um, and the, the, by an initiative, a co-Israeli-American initiative, 
So a, a wall is being built around it for most of the post-war decades. Uh, it was abandoned and often used also to dump trash from the city uh, in this area. Uh, you, you can see the intimacy of the killing there. Uh, if, if you consider that this is one hill in which uh, the killing occurred and the hill behind is the Federal Hill and the town is in the middle. Um, one memorial was built in the area of the cemetery a few years ago. Uh, the last time I was there, however, it was very hard to approach uh, and uh, because there was very thick vegetation around it. And it was said to have been broken by local hooligans. Uh, I have no information on it having been repaired. Uh, again, this was an initiative, an outside initiative. Other memorials were, were built in the town. So apart from the memorial for the um, um, uh, Oonupa uh, on Federal Hill, there's another memorial for Stepan Bandera, who was the leader of the more radical faction of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists. Now, things that were changing in Buchach uh, on the eve of the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, and a bust of Shmuel Yosef Agnon, the writer I mentioned, uh, has been put up uh, in Buchach on initiative of uh, a young woman from Buchach um, and a, a center, a sort of literary center uh, was created. You, you can see another bust uh, here of Agnon and a literary center for readings uh, was created in the street that was renamed Vulita Agnona. Um, so there were efforts, I won't go into all the details of that, but part of the effort also included a connection between this literary uh, center to which some Ukrainian writers were invited to, uh, to remember uh, Agnon and the kind of Buchash that he described, particularly in his famous 1939 novel, A Guest for the Night, which describes his own visit to the city in 1930. Um, so part of that was also a collaboration with the Agnon House in Jerusalem. Uh, obviously because of the war uh, right now, um, this um, is not occurring anymore. Uh, but it was a very hopeful sign of a recognition of the city, of the town, of its own rich Jewish and, of course, Polish past, uh, which had largely been forgotten for many decades after the war. Uh, this does not include, however, commemoration of the, of the Holocaust itself or any memorials initiated by the municipality. Um, now, I want to take you quickly to what part of this uh, did to me as a historian coming to these places and thinking about how does the local population of a town such as Buchach think, and not only Buchach, but many towns in uh, West Ukraine, which was heavily populated by Jews, over 10% of the population was Jewish, and at least half of the population of mid-sized uh, towns uh, in the area um, was Jewish. Uh, how did the local population uh, interact with what was left of uh, the people who had lived there, mostly in the form of synagogues and cemeteries? Uh, and in some soul searching, I started thinking about my own uh, childhood. Uh, and that took me back to growing up in uh, Ramat Aviv, which is north of this river, of the Alcon River. So it's north of North Tel Aviv, just across. It's where the University of Tel Aviv is now. Um, and I used to play in that area before the university was built. And it's uh, because the university was created uh, really in the 1950s, but much more in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and there was a village there, and that village was called Al Shahmuanis, and we knew it as Shahmuanis. This is how we called it. Uh, when I was growing up, most of the population there were uh, Moroccan Jews who had come there in the 1950s. Uh, we had a vague idea that it had been an Arab village, but nobody spoke about what it was. Uh, and this is more, more or less where this is located. 
this was a large village that reached all the way to the coast and to uh, what later became Tel Aviv. Um, there are detailed maps of it and photographs also that the British took during the British mandate. When I played there, what we used to see were remnants of a, a Muslim cemetery there and were remnants of a house that we call the Sheikh's house, uh, now known as the Green House. Uh, that village was basically occupied and uh, its population was evicted uh, by Israeli forces in 1948. There is a long history of what happened there, which I won't uh, belabor now. Uh, but uh, this was part of a, a general um, uh, expulsion of Palestinian populations from uh, uh, what became uh, the state of Israel. So about 750,000 Palestinians were deported, evicted, uh, or expelled, or fled uh, from the areas that became uh, the state of Israel, and only about 150,000 remain there, many of them internally say so not even in their own communities. Um, so this area was uh, occupied and gradually destroyed uh, and became uh, part of where the, the University of Tel Aviv is. Uh, none or almost none of the cemetery remains, whereas this house uh, eventually was remodeled, the house that I used to play in, which was the, what we call the Sheikh's house, and became uh, a, the so-called greenhouse, which has been used as the faculty club, uh, where members of the faculty can have a nice, elegant lunches. So this is what I wanted to share with you as a um, presentation in the last two minutes that I have left, right? I have about two minutes, right? Um, I'll just mention the second part and hopefully we'll get to more of it. So what, what interests me uh, really uh, in, in this issue is how, what I call how memory is used as a tool of forgetting. And what I've uh, tried to think through is the relationship between uh, memory laws uh, that have been passed in Ukraine, Poland, and Israel, and how they relate to each other. These are three countries that think of themselves, obviously rightly, as countries that have been heavily victimized, that, that have had terrible uh, human losses, uh, devastation, uh, certainly in the 20th century. Um, and if you think about the, particularly the Holodomor for Ukraine, if you think about Poland, conceiving itself as the Christ of nations, as a country that paid the huge price in World War II. And if you think of Israel as seeing itself really as the, as the, 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 the inheritor of the Holocaust, as the carrier of the memory of the Holocaust, um, then you have three countries that see themselves uh, as uh, paramount examples of victimhood. Uh, and yet, um, the, the victimhood of one is often in competition with the other. So I, do, I don't have time any longer to talk about this, but if we examine uh, memories of law, uh, laws, memory laws passed uh, in Ukraine, uh, particularly regarding honoring the uh, Ukrainian heroes of their own UPA, uh, uh, if we examine uh, Polish memory laws, that uh, make it uh, an offense to deny that what the own UPA did in uh, East Poland was genocide. And if we examine Israeli memory laws that make any commemoration uh, of the Nakba, that is of the expulsion of Palestinians, and especially mourning the, the expulsion of Palestinians on what in Israel is considered to be Independence Day, then we can see uh, a kind of cycle of uh, memory where remembering one event that is one's own victimhood necessitates erasing or marginalizing or negating uh, the memory of the victimhood of others, uh, particularly those who are connected in one way or another to one's own uh, history. And I'll be happy to say much more about it uh, in the discussion. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, uh, um, uh, Thank you uh, for uh, introducing uh, this fascinating topic on uh, Buchach, but uh, going far beyond Buchach uh, in this uh, comments on uh, memory law and the situation in Israel. Um, we'll definitely get to it, uh, get back to it in the discussion. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, we'll also hear another story after. Um, hearing uh, the expert on the early memorials uh, and the, their evolution and having this expert family account as well on Buchach. Uh, now I would like to invite you to listen to uh, uh, an activist, a sportsman and sort of outsider in the field of uh, uh, commemoration who became insider, uh, Dariusz Popiela, uh, who is an Olympian, uh, a 10-time Polish kayaking champion and two-time vice European champion uh, in kayaking. Uh, and uh, he is widely known in Poland as a sportsman, as an Olympian, but recently his parallel life as an activist uh, uh, is uh, even more um, known and uh, recognized. Uh, he created the project which is titled uh, called uh, People Not Numbers. Um, the project uh, uh, which has uh, the goal to individually commemorate the victims uh, of the Holocaust, uh, to give the names uh, to the people who were only considered as numbers for uh, the time of the Holocaust and very often after, also afterwards. Uh, Dariusz has uh, managed to successfully honor the victims of several towns in the south of Poland, uh, in the towns of Kroszczenko, Grybów, uh, Czarny Dunajec, Nowy Targ, and recently in Nowy Sąd. All of that happened within a uh, few years with the group of uh, uh, volunteers and activists from uh, these towns and the region. And we are talking about honoring of thousands of people with their individual names and bringing back their individual stories. Uh, Darius will talk more about uh, his experience in this commemoration. The floor is yours, Darius. Yes, hello uh, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. It's a, a real honor. Uh, and to make um, a long story short, I will just start uh, my presentation. And I think uh, the history of uh, of the project people not numbers and it, it's also my private story and it it i think it it will show uh, also uh, what we remember how we remember because maybe later in the discussion uh, there will be some question because when i start my project i didn't knew anything about uh, the reason why I started my project uh, was that I didn't know anything um, uh, about the Holocaust uh, of of my hometown, in fact, of Nova Sanj, uh, Jewish citizens, and 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 this is this was um, uh, the way to establish the uh, the project uh, People Not Numbers. So I will just uh, share the screen, just one second, um, and uh, shortly I will try to. Mm. start presentation okay so yeah so basically like uh, like uh, edita said uh, uh, i am an athlete a polish uh, sportsman um, and this is also part of this story because the reason why i have eagle on my chest and i use the white and red colors during the uh, races uh, during the starts uh, championships um, um, uh, it's a um, part of my uh, history yeah? part of my story uh, because to represent Poland for me is something more than just to wear a jacket and to uh, get the medals at, at some point for me was uh, to be the part of the Polish team uh, that I I, I need to find answer about the history of Poland. Of course, not uh, not uh, uh, not completely story, but that was my goal to uh, realize what you are um, representing. Yeah, this, this was very important. And this and the part of the story was that I discovered uh, the Jewish story in uh, in the story of 
um, uh, of uh, of my hometown and then i established the project um, people not numbers and as you can see the each color it's a color of different city each year we uh, we made one uh, one project in one town as you can see it's already five um, uh, places where we act and talking about memory i think this uh, short movie it's also some kind of answer about how we remember and what we remember because um, in fact i am uh, more um, let's say practical yeah uh, in, and uh, and uh, usually this is uh, the level uh, how when our project start this is the cemetery this is the jewish cemetery and few years ago um, it looks like this uh, and and uh, i always compare the um, the uh, the situation on the cemetery with the uh, level of knowledge of local population if the cemetery is completely neglected uh, for me, this is information uh, that the knowledge in the local community uh, generally is very poor. And as you can see at these uh, pictures, um, before, it, uh, it, it's a place where nearly 120 people are buried in the two mass graves. And as you can see before, it was the middle. It was completely uh, forgotten place. Yeah, during our project, um, we have no time to explain everything, but we cooperate with the rabbinic commission. They make they made special um, research, um, uh, and and we find out the mass graves uh, at this cemetery. And at each cemetery where we act, we discover the mass graves that were like on this picture on the top, completely neglected completely forgotten um, and and uh, just to show you how it was before and after and and this is what what we are in fact uh, doing at each cemetery um, uh, because also i um, the the project is my answer um, with the knowledge about the holocaust with the knowledge uh, that i find out this, about this huge tragedy. And, and this is all the time the project is also my answer, um, my personal answer uh, to this uh, huge tragedy. And, uh, and that's why I, I find out that because the cemeteries are neglected, are forgotten, we need to bring back the memory to the local population about this place. And uh, through this place, we can bring back the memory about the Jewish community uh, in the local uh, population these days. Yeah, and uh, uh, each project uh, at the cemetery we finish with the uh, monument uh, and uh, with what is very important. What I will show you later with the name and surname at the monument with the all victims from the village or town it depend where we act and my idea was because uh, i was 20 few years old when i discovered the um, i knew about auschwitz i knew about the um, ghetto uprising about uh, um, jewish um, tragedy about the holocaust but but i didn't knew what happened in my in my hometown i didn't know what happened in my district my region yeah and 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 when i uh, discover uh, this whole story my answer was how it's possible that we don't want to remember or we for we forget about them because uh, when i discover the old story i try to google at my phone and um, where is the a monument in my city where I can uh, light a candle or uh, pray for these all uh, victims. And uh, for me, sadly, um, there there was uh, there wasn't such a monument, such a commemoration place. And and for me, it was big shock. And till that time, um, since that moment, uh, I, I I have 
so many emotion in myself that I need to act. And 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 that's how I I, I discover that to uh, make a project project su successful, we need to engage the local community. Uh, we need to engage local um, important important person like priest, like um, mayor, like the uh, the leaders of the local communities. Uh, because in Poland uh, these days, in fact, we are talking about the memory um, about the Holocaust, Holocaust victims without Jews, because in these areas, in the small villages, there are no um, no Jews anymore. And and uh, on the shoulder of the Christian communi community or non-Jewish community, uh, it's the memory, in fact. And that's why we invite uh, people yeah, like like Rabbi Shudrik, like a German consul from Krakow, um, and and we try to bring back the people and to uh, to to bring back the memory about uh, Jewish community, but also about the places, about the cemetery. Uh, like in Gribov, for example, yeah, there was nearly five hundred people suddenly. And the picture and the movie that you uh, that I show you before was was exactly from this cemetery, completely neglected. And then during the commemoration, it was uh, 500 people with us. What is also very important for me is a present of the descendant of the um, of the Jewish uh, families. Sometimes in the small village, it's a one, two families, not not more. For example, in Kroschenko, just five people survive uh, Holocaust. Yeah, so. Uh, so, so this is also important point to find out the descendant, to uh, invite them to our ceremony, and to uh, cry with them, spend time with them, uh, to pray together, and to uh, to to read the name and surname of the uh, victims. This is very very important. Uh, this is the the exactly uh, what I am telling about the name and surname part of our project is of course meeting with the uh, with the youth in the schools uh, in each town each uh, village we invite local schools to our project sometimes there are two free schools sometimes even four it depends from the from the place or like in Novisonj during uh, the commemoration there was a uh, 13 schools um, from our uh, city so so I try to involve the youth uh, to 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 the project because um, I, I have no I, I before I had no clue uh, about the Holocaust so I share with them not the historical fact I am also sharing with them my story the story in fact um, of uh, of um, some kind of uh, discover yeah, for me because in fact it was like this I discovered this big tragedy um, uh, we are uh, usually visiting Belgium's extermination camp because uh, th this is the place where the uh, Jews from the, uh, my area from the Małopolska region were murdered nearly four Four hundred fifty thousand of um, uh, of, of uh, people, yeah. And this is very important place because people from the city where we act, from the villages, suddenly they discover that at the monuments, uh, at the monument, there is a name of their city, of their village. But in their city, their village, there is no memory. And this is also first step uh, to to um, to take a part in our uh, project. Of course, during the our project we are um, uh, we are trying to use local media local um, uh, television or radio to uh, bring back the stories about the local community about the local jewish community and and that, that's why we publish their stories publish their photos of course there is there, there, this, these are hours and hours um, uh, that that our uh, volunteers spend in the um, um, uh, in the um, uh, archives here yeah, to 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 bring back this knowledge because the, this the, the families are still there they are still in the archives and this is what we are trying to do we display their this want to display their story share their story with the local community uh, this is example of the two uh, plaques from uh, um, Czarne Dunajec uh, 500 victims yeah with the name surname and the 
the age because this is my answer for the Holocaust. They are not anymore some kind of uh, stero stereotypical Jews or numbers. They are people with the name and surname and sometimes where it's possible also with the age. And people ca can identify with the name, with surname, with age. And this is uh, this is very important. During our project, we discover a lot of um, signs of the uh, Jewish community, like Matsevot, uh, that they were stolen from the cemetery sometimes after the war and uh, made by um, Christian neighbors, for example, or non-Jewish um, neighbors. Yeah, and we are bringing we are bringing them back. We sometimes we um, restore them, uh, renovate them. Uh, because uh, sometimes, like in Czarny Dunajec um, or Krościenko, uh, after the hundreds population of hundreds of Jews, just one single Matsevot was at the cemetery. So um, this is also, I think, uh, some kind of answer how we remember and what, what we remember. So uh, we are trying to show the local community that th these are the gravestone their places at the cemetery um, and this you can also see how how transition is going on oh, i just want to uh, one one more time um, um re uh, remind you that we cooperate with rabbinic commission the all 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 works that we are doing are um are uh, with with them and as you can see the empty cemetery slowly uh, is changing but also uh, the 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 photos show the people around because usually we start with two three volunteers and we are finishing with 20 30 volunteers that they are ready to act um uh, whatever it takes and whenever it takes so I, I i'm just speaking about people who are very very involved and this is how the commemoration looks like um, looks at the end um, this these are the examples of the restoration renovation of matsevot uh, also the story of uh, Tali Nates, uh, that, that she is with us today, um, the Matsevot of uh, her family member. We discovered at the one um, backyard uh, in the city of Novitark, and it was exactly like this. And then uh, it was possible to renovate and to find out to find out uh, Tali in South Africa. That was also a big challenge and something uh, unbelievable. But I am always explaining to the youth that the, this story is not over. There is no dot at the end um, when we are speaking about the commemoration of the uh, victims of, uh, of, of Holocaust. And a few examples how the... Uh, how, how the um, the cemetery change or like in Novi Sonj, the square where we build the monument to commemorate 12,000 uh, victims uh, with the name and surname. Um, for me, it was very important to involve the local uh, community. This is always the biggest challenge for me to bring them uh, to our um, to, to be the partner to be a part of our project and this is how it looks like now we are completely social project the the monument in Novi Sonj was created by private donation um, the uh, big our big uh, partner was the foundation Ledor Vador um, and uh, and except of this donation mostly was uh, from the private money so uh, not governmental we are we are trying to do all by ourselves and people not numbers it's not only um, uh, word uh, identify with the uh, with the victims but also people not people create this project volunteers people uh, who want to remember who uh, feel that this is something very very uh, important in the short way uh, this is uh, this is uh, this is what we do and how we do uh, of course i have no time to explain you exactly uh, all steps but uh, it was pleasure to 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 speak about it. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Darius. Uh, it was a really um, fascinating description of your work uh, and in a natural uh, showing all the aspects of it. Uh, and now we have uh, time to uh, discuss uh, um, 
all what you have presented uh, and go even beyond uh, what was discussed uh, with uh, some additional questions. Uh, before I ask the first question, I would like to encourage people in the audience to write your own questions in the chat. Uh, we have the first questions already. I'm sure um, you've been uh, inspired by um, all three presentations and we'll um, get back to the questions uh, soon. Uh, so uh, my first question, in fact, to um, all uh, of you is uh, about uh, the uh, evolution of memory in each of the cases you described what are the uh, stages of the um, uh, of the evolution how it evolved what were the factors that uh, um, changed the, the 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 remembrance aspect but also the memory of uh, of the holocaust uh, in each of the uh, places, projects, uh, or um, maybe one case that you uh, would like to focus on. So um, let me start with, uh, with uh, James Young. Yeah, I picked the, uh, the case of Auschwitz-Birkenau um, just because it's uh, maybe the most radical change came with the fall of the Iron Curtain. Um, uh, the turning of Poland from a uh, communist state satellite, if you will, the Soviet Union, you know, to the West, and this in this turn to the West, uh, they uh, uh, incorporated the understanding of the Holocaust in World War II, uh, then from the West, in particular West Ger West Germany, Israel, um, and so one of the very first things they did <clears throat> was to ask the question. Um, uh, of Auschwitz itself, of Auschwitz-Birkenau, um, what was being remembered there was completely historically untrue. Um, the Soviets and the you know the Communist Party in uh, uh, in Poland at the time in 1967, you know, quite literally inflated the total number of victims at Auschwitz in order to uh, diminish proportionally the number of Jewish victims there, and it it reflected. Um, an understandable uh, version. By understandable, I, I don't mean sympathetic, but <clears throat> Poles understood that the Jews murdered during the Holocaust were murdered as both Poles and Jews, and that the, the identities were subsumed. And um, and there was a weird, you know, symmetry uh, between Jewish and Polish victims uh, of the six million uh, Poles. Uh, who died in World War II, um, about 3 million of those uh, were Polish Jews, 3 million non-Jewish Poles, um, you know, 6 million total Jews, nearly 6 million total Jews died, so that these kind of coincidental uh, symmetrical numbers ended up reinforcing this understanding. And this is why I, I wanted to read the exact language to you, because they really understood <clears throat> that uh, in 1947, the Polish parliament declared that the rest of the Auschwitz would be forever preserved as a memorial to the martyrdom of the Polish nation and other peoples. But it was really meant to remember um, the, the martyrdom of the Jews as a kind of Gehenna, so that when the Auschwitz was actually dedicated, um, uh, uh, Janusz Wieczorek um, gave kind of a consummate expression to the then contemporary Polish understanding of Auschwitz um, when he said, distinguished guests here at the graveyard of Europe, at this necro uh, ne necropolis of human hopes and inconceivable drama, one should keep silent, but to keep silent also means to resign, yet your presence today proves we have not given up. We are richer with the true facts discovered in the laboratories of scientists and statisticians examining the history of World War II. Martyrology of states and nations condemned by Nazi Germany to political and biological extermination. Among those doomed, Jews and Poles rank in the first place. So there was complete you know, um, uh, understanding 
that they kind of occupy Jews and Poles and Poles as Jews and Jews as Poles. <laughs> Uh, you know, we're completely uh, uh, conflated in this understanding. Um, and then the way that they understood Auschwitz itself uh, is really, really interesting. And this is, again, the, the Polish government um, explaining that these these places, Auschwitz, Treblinka, Helmno, Płaszow, Belzec, you know, Zobibor, Wuj, uh, Bialystok, Warsaw Ghetto, um, these are all stages of extermination, stations of the cross of Polish Jews and Jews treacherously brought from other countries in Europe and then this, this statement tells you everything you need to know. We know nearly everything about their Gehenna or Calvary. That is, we know everything about the Jewish Calvary, the misery of Poles. So they understood that the averted genocide of Poland and Polish, uh, Polish non-Jews, which had been also planned, was now going to be remembered in the actualized you know, genocide of Jews in Poland. And so that, that understanding has begun to evolve. Um, it continues to evolve. But um, the, the case at Auschwitz is most interesting because they took, Mazowiecki appointed this panel literally to remake memory um, now in the, uh, in the guise of a, new, uh, of a new government understanding of what actually happened there, uh, including changing the numbers back to what they originally, you know, what, they, what they actually were. Yes, and that's interesting what you are saying, especially in the context of some of the um, um, manifestations of the right wing activists uh, claiming return Auschwitz to the Poles. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, bringing the memory back of the Jews who were killed there. It's uh, taking uh, the memory of the Poles away from this place. It's, it's certainly some competition of memory there. Uh, but I would like to uh, move to Omer to uh, uh, the, my question about the evolution, how the memory evolved in case of Buchaj or any other case that you would, would like to discuss in this context. Sure, thanks. So, um, I mean, what, what Jane says is, of course, the, the cardinal point that the main change in all of uh, Eastern Europe is uh, the fall of the communist regimes, which changes the memory regime uh, in those areas. Uh, but obviously the change is not only in the fact that you can now speak uh, about uh, what happened to the Jews differently. Uh, it's also that each of those countries, and somebody was asking about that on, uh, on the chat, also in the Baltic countries, you can also talk about um, your own past differently. Um, and, and, and that creates a new kind of competition. So in the area of Buchaj or West Ukraine really, um, but it happens in many other places, you can think about Latvia and Lithuania as interesting examples too. Uh, those people who were considered by the communist regime to be the, the bad apples, uh, those who had collaborated with the, with the fascists, uh, now uh, re-emerge as national heroes. And you can see that in stone. You can see it actually being commemorated um, in books, in uh, uh, some figures return to politics. Um, now, those same, not all of them, many of those national heroes that are now being commemorated for having fought for independence, for national independence, for our people, uh, have uh, often been uh, associated also with working with the Nazis to kill the Jews, or uh, if not working with the Nazis, doing it on their own initiative. Uh, so uh, that creates an entirely new kind of, comp of competition of memory. Now, if you add to that the fact that with the fall of communism and the emergence of the EU now is the most attractive uh, association for East European countries, uh, here, the emergence of the Holocaust as an important historical event, which is recognized by Europe in 2000, in, in the year 2000, in an international conference in Stockholm, uh, as an event to be commemorated and to be remembered, which we think was always that, but was not. It's something that happens decades after the event itself. Uh, one of the conditions for joining the EU for East European countries is to recognize the Shoah in their own land. And that creates all kinds of problems because um, obviously 
East European countries want to join the EU. It's a pretty attractive offer, but it creates problems with how do you contend with your own past. Uh, that very past, which the communists actually didn't want to talk about very much. Uh, so the kind of repression of memory under the communists brings back both the Holocaust and the collaboration in the killing of the Jews and brings up all the national heroes. So that is one, um, uh, I'd say, um, type of competition of memories that is uh, appears at the you know at the late eighties, early nineties, and is still uh, up for grabs today. And depends, as you know, in Poland and in other countries, depends to some extent on internal um, um, competition over which kind of regime we want. Uh, in the case of of Israel, which I want to mention, uh, and there were some questions about that. Uh, it's it's interesting because the those who don't know the Holocaust is not a major issue in Israeli politics of memory right after the Holocaust. It takes time for it to emerge as it does in other countries. It's not immediately there. Survivors are there, obviously. Yad Vashem is created in, in the 1950s, but the Holocaust is the main kind of core of Israeli identity. Um, it, it takes decades. Um, and without getting into too many details, it's really after the War of 73, it's in the 70s and 80s. It also then becomes part of a, um, I'd say, um, of, of a major political tool uh, for Israeli government. Now, the, the, the problem with that kind of centralization of the Holocaust in Israeli um, uh, uh, politics of identity is that along with that, there is a growing emergence of the story of the Palestinian. And there is a relationship between them. That is, Palestinian activists are also learning from Israeli commemorative practices. But that, of course, goes entirely against the grain of what the Jewish state is about and what 1948 was and must remain within Israeli um, politics of identity. That is, it is liberation, right? It's called actually in Hebrew, the war of liberation. Uh, liberated from whom, right? Because the Brits left. Uh, the war was not against the Brits, uh, but it, for Israeli politics of identity, the Holocaust is a, is, is a cardinal moment of beginning. It's the, it's, the, it's the hour zero. Now, if you suddenly say, well, wait a minute, but in that war, uh, tens, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were expelled or were, 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 were terrified to leave and to flee, uh, through a, a, a vast amount of violence, which has been documented very well by Israeli historians using Israeli documents, Israeli government and army documents. Uh, how do we square that circle? So uh, here, the, the role of the Holocaust in Israel, uh, as Israel being the um, the the moment of redemption as the as the the resurrection of of Jews as the moment of glory uh, of of rebirth after the Holocaust is marred by the fact that the state is created by turning the majority population into a minority by evicting the majority so that there will be finally a Jewish majority state uh, that creates huge um, I'd say conflict within society, despite the fact that the, that the historical facts are known and no longer disputed. Uh, among historians, there's no dispute as to what actually occurred. It's only within political rhetoric, educational policies, and so forth. The final thing I'll say is that this is all connected to um, the relationship between uh, Israel and many other countries, but particularly, and that, that is what interested me also because of my own work, uh, Ukraine and uh, Poland. So in 2006, some of you may remember, uh, the then Ukrainian president, Viktor Yushchenko, uh, came to Israel, visited Israel. And 
the, the, the sort of underlying logic of that visit was that uh, Israel would recognize what had just been declared by Yushiko would recognize uh, the Holodomor as genocide. Uh, now, why did Yushiko need Israel to recognize the Holodomor as genocide? Uh, well, it had to do with the fact that Israel was seen, and in some ways he was right to think that way, as the most important country to put a stamp of approval on the Holodomor as genocide. Um, and it would then take away the kind of accusation uh, that was current and remains in many, in white circles in Israel, that the Ukrainians collaborated en masse uh, in, in the Holocaust. Um, and so that in some ways by recognizing the equivalent uh, victimhood of uh, Ukrainians in, 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 a, in, in a Stalin directed genocide, there would be now no longer this kind of competition b between the two countries. Obviously, this didn't happen. And Israel did not recognize the Holodomor as a uh, genocide. Also, because for Israeli political needs, the Holocaust must remain outside of that discussion. It is not something like another genocide. It has to remain out of that. It has to be something that gives increasingly Israeli government's license to say we are above criticism. No country can criticize us for what we do because of what happened to us. Uh, this is very similar in the dispute that was between Israel and Poland, as you all remember, uh, over whether we can speak about the fact that Poles, as again, has been well documented in recent research, uh, that uh, Poles actually participated in killing Jews that Poles could be both victims of German occupation and victimizers of Jews at the same time. Uh, that for Poland, uh, within the, the, the general po Polish discourse is extremely difficult to accept because it undermines one's position as this uh, country of victims. Uh, for, for Israelis to accept the fact that um, you cannot talk about it, uh, is equivalent to uh, Palestinians accepting that you cannot talk about the Nakba. And to me, I'll just end with one example because when uh, Jan Tomasz Gross's uh, book came out uh, in 2000, uh, he came to visit uh, Israel. It was actually the first time I met him. Um, and we, we had a very nice meeting. And at the time he was interviewed by an Israeli newspaper. And the interesting thing was that uh, in Poland, when the book came out, as we all know, it created a huge furore and so forth, uh, because how is it possible that Poles were killing Jews? It was the Germans who were doing it. And when he was interviewed in Israel, the journalist said, so what are you telling us that Poles were killing Jews? We knew that all along. What is so new about your book? So much of what we are talking about is how different communities have already created particular regimes of memory that are completely different from the other ones. And while they can be reading the same history, the, the, the preconceptions come from a completely different place. And that changes over time, but you, you have to understand that the, the, the preconceptions are quite different from one country to another. Yes, sure. Thank you for this uh, thoughts uh, on uh, the victimhood, using vi victimhood as the political tool, but also being selective in mentioning the active role, uh, both as the resistance and uh, as uh, the op oppressor uh, in this case. Um, I'm curious what uh, Darius wants to uh, tell us about the evolution, evolving memory, and we'll get back <clears throat> to some ideas that you shared already. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would like to show you uh, one more uh, picture, uh, and I think I will I will again try to show you um, the local um, evolution, which I think will confirm what the professors uh, were telling about, uh, because this is the, um, just I will share my screen, The this is the picture 
um, of the plaque that was originally put on the side of the mass grave were nearly uh, approximately 500 to 800 Jews were murdered in Novitark. And just imagine that I think it was, I'm not sure, but it was one of the uh, first uh, commemoration after um, after Holocaust, because the date when this uh, plaque was um, uh, was set up uh, uh, at the at the mass grave site, it's the 30 of August 1945. And it was made by the Jew who survived the Holocaust, um, uh, Mr. Hertz, 20 years old. Um, and just imagine that after a few weeks uh, later, um, Mr. Hertz was murdered uh, by the neighbors because it was after liberation. There was not any more uh, Germans over there. And this uh, Ludwig Hertz, he was the... Uh, let's say the uh, the this 20 years um, old um, man was a, um, a chief of the local Jewish community of survivors he was murdered and just imagine uh, at the invitation there was his name and surname they sent invitation to the Krakow Jewish community uh, that the commemoration will took place but but uh, this is the tragic things. He was murdered just after a few weeks, few weeks later, and the Jew escaped from this area, from Novetark, from uh, from 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 um, uh, Pothale district, because the 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 Jews were murdered by group of partisan uh, and also uh, by uh, some uh, neighbors. Yeah. So this is exactly what you were talking about before. And then the communism start. There is a nothing going on at this cemetery um, um, just some volunteers try to do something but in 80s just to clean or something like this when the communism collapse there is a first commemoration made by um, jews from israel the survivors the family of the survivors and uh, another 20 years uh, later, there is our commemoration. Yeah, so this is something what professor said uh, before. This is this is at the local ground. This is something like this. And and when we speak with the local community, um, th there is always this uh, this competition. Yeah, there is always. Um, but but in my opinion. Um, the, also, I I didn't knew anything about the Holocaust before. Yeah, so uh, so these local communities very often they, they even don't re realize um, how many Jews were murdered in the cities or villages, and that's the uh, biggest problem because when they realize the many uh, stereotypes um, are destroyed because. Uh, in some places, they still believe that Jew will come back and they will restore their properties. And then I explain them, uh, it's impossible because in your city survive, for example, three, four uh, Jewish people. Yeah. So this is the level that we are uh, talking about. Uh, some people say now it changed a lot. From one point of view, yes, but from the other, uh, the the biggest issue is uh, indifference. People just don't care. They uh, they have no clue. Like like you said, uh, like Mr. Professor said before about um, uh, the victims uh, from Auschwitz uh, uh, death camp. Yeah, uh, there are still people that they are discussing with me that uh, that the Poles were the uh, biggest number of uh, of victims. I uh, and I, I always I don't want to uh, lose my time to uh, to discuss such a thing so I, I i just saying visit the official website and check because there is exactly everything yeah but but this is the level uh, which i am trying to <laughs> to change in this local communities because sometimes the story like i told you before that ludwig hertz was murdered by poles not by uh, by germans is a shock they don't believe in it yeah uh, but also there is a group of people who remember, uh, of course, this group is um, uh, year and year uh, smaller, yeah? the people are dying, the, the witness are dying, and they, of course, remember uh, this, this sad stories, this tragic story, 
um, and and very often uh, they remember their friends they are talking about them but they still exist in the in the big groups of some Jews of some numbers yeah um, and and this is this is the the the, the problem so at this local um, uh, ground you can see this this what what, what was going on at this this was the example of Novitark cemeteries, yeah, and and you can see this on the monuments how the uh, hi the the history of commemoration uh, was was made there, yeah. Um, Darius, as you are speaking, I have two questions directly to you, which are uh, kind of related to what you were saying. Just saying, um, one is about uh, do you uh, have any support? Uh, uh, involvement or understanding of local inhabitants in your commemoration mission. So, uh, what is the reaction of uh, local people? Yeah, the mostly the first reaction because usually I go to the mayor of pre or president of the city. So, first is Mr. Darius. Maybe better don't do anything because there will be a lot of troubles, a lot of uh, uh, problems. But I always try to explain to the mayor that he's in charge of the local population and the Jews were part of this population. Because like professor said, of course, there, there was a, in, during communism uh, time, there was no difference between, uh, that there was just the victims, they were Poles, yeah, and it was generally uh, how they called the victims, yeah, and and for them, uh, in many cases, they have no clue what happens in their uh, in their uh, cities or or villages. So I'm trying to to change this vision, and usually uh, it works slowly, uh, but it works. And sometimes when they are against, after one year of our project, they are part of uh, of our team, and this is this is very important. So with knowledge we can change this, but 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 slowly, slow it it, it happens uh, very slowly. So usually, uh, no, in every commemoration uh, that took place, we have uh, the uh, our partners is local community. Otherwise, um, I don't know if the project. Uh, will be um, uh, finished yes yeah? so so always we we have a um, we have a part of community because i cannot say that we change the whole local uh, community no of course no there there are of course some groups that they are part of our projects and and i am happy that uh, that each time there are many surprises you know sometimes there are some uh, youth sometimes there are uh, emirates yeah? sometimes uh, uh, the people, uh, some some old people, young people, uh, someone, some uh, people from religious group, uh, punks group. So uh, people from different worlds. Yeah, uh, but but the idea of commemoration when they realize the scale and they usually the. the most important moment is when they see the list of the victims and they realize the scale, and this is something what also changed me and my perspective um, and 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 it it usually works with the local community each each place where we act it's it's open uh, non stop there are no no one closed the cemetery or something and 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 uh, till today nothing happened so uh, so yeah so i think without local community it will be different but but this is how, what we are trying to do, to bring them together, to act together. But this is the process, yeah? And I cannot say that we changed those those places, but we are trying to do this, yeah? Thank you, thank you. This is uh, also part of my uh, next uh, question, which uh, I'm afraid uh, due to the time limit, uh, I won't be able to um, ask. It's about the actors in the process of uh, remembering, because we are talking uh, also about who remembers uh, and why people do not remember and why people um, in organically forget. And this is the whole issue of uh, contradiction between remembering uh, and uh, forgetting and forgetting being sometimes the state uh, project or the state uh, politics. But uh, I would like to also give you a chance to reply to some of the questions in, in the chat uh, before we close our discussion. Um, I wonder um, 
uh, Omar, if you had a chance to look up the questions about your comments on uh, Arabs uh, in Israel and the settlements. Uh, um... Yeah, I mean, I can I can quickly just uh, say that in line very much with what um, Darius was just saying, uh, you know, there's knowledge and there are opinions. And in, 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 in fraught historical moments and uh, referring to fraught moments in the past, uh, they don't always work together. Um, I, I, I started my career writing about the crimes of the German army on the Eastern Front. And you know my uh, first book on that came out in 85. The second book came out in 91. And there was a big debate about that in the late 1990s in Germany, is it possible the German soldiers took part in crimes on the Eastern Front, although everything had already been documented. So historians knew it, the documents showed it, but the public had a, had a great difficulty accepting it. Not the Holocaust, but the involvement of the German army because that really represented the German nation. And there is the same thing regarding Israel in 1948. There is a vast amount of documentation, documentation by Israeli authorities by the Israeli state, by the Israeli military from 1947, 48, 49, both on the expulsion of Palestinians and of course on the utter refusal of Israel then to accept any of those refugees back, which has remained until today and the destruction of their property so that the, even if they were to somehow infiltrate back, they would not be able to live in their homes because over 400 villages were destroyed. Uh, but we have a number of participants who are disputing that. And, you know, what they can do is take, say, Benny Moises' uh, vast study of the origins of the Palestinian question and read it. Uh, and that book came out two decades ago, and it's all there. But it's interesting in the sense that there are really different types of, different types of memory. Uh, there, there is historical memory that is what historians write and document, and that can be disputed. That we, no, no book is definitive, but there are certain aspects of that that can be uh, documented. We can still have people who deny the Holocaust. I've, I'm, I'm constantly asked about that, but that has nothing to do with documentation. It's got to do with something else. So there is historical knowledge of the past, and then we have what people want to believe. And usually what people want to believe is not their own memory, but it's something that they internalize because of the politics of the place in which they live and because of the problems that are caused by changing that kind of memory, by looking up to the past. And to my mind, in countries like Ukraine, like Poland, and like Israel, one of the main problems is to look back at what in Poland people speak about as a difficult past. As long as you don't look into your difficult past, it's very hard to create a healthy future because this will always come back to haunt you in one way or another. It's happening now in Poland, it's happening in Ukraine, and I'm afraid it may happen more. I, we don't know what will be at the end of that war. And it's right up for grabs in Israel now. We cannot understand what is happening right now in Israel without that inability to actually accept the past and come to terms with it. Germans have done it to a larger extent, in part because Germany was de defeated and destroyed and because the crimes it committed were so vast that they were really impossible to deny. But that's a really important process that many countries, including of course the United States today, are grappling with. How do you look back at your own difficult past and come to terms with it? Thank you so much. Uh, this is such an important message. Uh, um, I'm all, almost tempted to uh, to uh, close the meeting right now with your message about the understanding and working on the past uh, uh, in order to build a greater future. Uh, there are a few questions left. I hope we'll, we can answer in a chat. Uh, Darius, there's one question for you, uh, if you can quickly answer in the chat. But I have a very quick question uh, for uh, Professor James Young. Uh, to close the meeting. You were the advisor uh, to several projects of commemorating uh, the past. 
what would be your advice for commemorating, remembering, remembrance of the Holocaust uh, in the places we discussed? Uh, is there any universal message that you would like to pass? <clears throat> I'm not sure if it's a universal message, um, but as Omer uh, just suggested, uh, every country uh, needs to come to terms with its own past uh, in its own way. Um, when, uh, just before joining a jury for uh, Germany's um, uh, memorial to Europe, uh, Europe's murdered Jews, uh, the Denkmal in Berlin, I explained that um, they, were, they were paralyzed <clears throat> because they were trying to do something that nobody had ever done before. You know, how, how to rebuild Germany, reunite Germany on the bedrock memory of its crimes has never been done before. And I, I used the example where in Washington DC on the National Mall, is there even one pebble to remember the slave auctions which were held right there for a hundred years? Washington, the United States has not built its memorial culture, its memorial legacy on the memory of America's, if you will, original sin of, of slavery. You know, 250 years of it here uh, is nowhere acknowledged, you know, in, on, the, on the National Mall. And the only response to that uh, must be, look at what the Germans have done. They have found a way uh, with great difficulty and great contention to remember, you know, that the mass murder of Jews um, uh, by the Germans is very much a part of German history and European history, and that they, in fact, have built a very strong democracy on that on that memory, as unlikely as that may seem. And um, you know, Clint uh, Clint Smith, uh, an American writer for the Atlantic Magazine, is uh, suggesting that in fact Americans have much to learn from German. Holocaust memorials and Holocaust memory, um, as we now seek to make central to American history and memory, um, the enslavement of millions and millions of Africans on these shores uh, and, and their mass murder and over in the Middle Passage. And uh, we, we need to build American, contemporary American history and culture, you know, on this, you know, huge missing piece. Um, so, how does every nation do that? How will Poland do it? Uh, how will Ukraine do it? How will Israel do it? Israel's struggling. Where where is the, you know, the Nakba? How how can Israel's great war of you know independence you know be regarded as the greatest catastrophe of all time? You know, by Palestinians who were you know dislocated dislocated, and it's built into Israeli history. Israel struggles with it. They've got a great generation of historians which are confronting it. Um, but it's a huge, huge struggle. So that insofar as every country has to struggle with um, how to commemorate, um, you, know, uh, you know, terrible crimes, you know, committed in the national name, um, uh, we're each gonna have to do it in our own ways, but we can look to the examples that are out there uh, in Poland, in Germany, in this country, Israel's doing it, you know, as best it can, it's, but it's a struggle for all of us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for, for your comment. Uh, so um, uh, we definitely have to educate. We need to do research. We need to think about the past, understand the past. Without that, there is no future, peaceful future. And we see that uh, uh, um, in our uh, times uh, today, we have, to, uh, we have to deal with the past first if we want to build the greater future. Uh, so I think with uh, that uh, uh, conclusion, um, uh, unfortunately, I have to close the meeting. We've been exceeding the time uh, given by the organizers, but the discussion was so interesting and so vital that uh, it was really a pity to close it down. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, the organizer, uh, but most important today, the three panelists, wonderful panelists, Professor James Young, Professor Omer Bartov, and Professor Inspe Dariusz Popiela. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you're doing great job. I've learned a lot. I'm sure people in the audience have learned a lot and uh, are inspired. Uh, and uh, we look forward to the next opportunity to have the discussion together.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Uh, and thank you very much. I hope to see you soon in Poland, maybe in April. You're more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much.